I'd like to ask you to please stand for the reading of God's Word. Psalm 103, verses 1 through 5. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities? Who heals all your diseases? Who redeems your life from destruction? Who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies? Who satisfies your mouth with good things? so that your, your youth is renewed like eagles. I invite you to take your hymnals and turn to number 10. All right, let's sing the first, second, and last. Number 10.
place this special. Would you please come on up here and tell us what you're doing? After. Oh, after that. by number 237. challenge your thinking. 
Here it is, you ready? This is the biggest church I've ever been in. Yeah, honest. Some of the strangest people I've ever met. But I <laughs> that was for Joelle. Um, and you probably already know what I mean, but it really is. Ministry, giving, encouragement. We've all been around. Nothing like here. I really mean that. Uh, you need to know that. It really is. Huge, huge ministry, encouragement, blessing. You guys, right here. So thank you. Thank you for taking care of us. Got a load of wood. Thank you all. Night. Fun to watch the kids unload it. And, uh, uh, and my wife's she's doing circles in the garage. It's not emotional issues, it's physical, okay? <laughs> so uh, we empty the garage out and she does circles. And Val's on her way to the homeless probably about as we speak. It's not a watch. But anyway, uh, all because, all because of you folks. I hope you really, really know that. So we thank God for you. Thank God for the privilege of being part of you. Thank you. Joseph, thanks for using your gift that way. That was very special this morning. That was very special. So we're going to do our Lord's Supper service first, and a uh, uh, very special time in the time of the church, right? Uh, when we um, when we do that, and um, when you think about it. I would like to focus today in our Lord's Supper service about what does God see when he looks at you? What does he see? What does he see? What do you think he sees? Just off the top of your head, what do you think he sees? What's that? I, I can't I can't hear you back then. Christ, He's in us, you mean. Yeah. Awesome answer. Awesome answer. I don't need hearing aids. You guys just need to speak louder. Okay? <laughs> Rosalie says, you need hearing aids. That, they talk about that on the commercials of the hearing aid. What? They talk about <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> I fall for that. <laughs> you did fall for that. <laughs> what do you think he sees when he looks at you? Think back to before you even knew him personally. What do you think he saw when he looked at you? What did he see? His image. His image in his creation. I love that answer. I love that answer. Do you know what I love the most? I didn't hear anything about my sin. Do you think he looks at me before I even knew him as nothing but a, a sinner, unredeemable, unusable, un anythingable? Do you think he did? I don't think so. I think when he looked at us, he looked past what we were and saw what we could be. I think that's what he did. He looked past what I was. He looked past a sinner headed for hell and he saw a redeemable soul that could serve him. That's what he saw. So because he saw something that was redeemable, what do you think he had to do? He had to die. He had to redeem us. <laughs> That's what he had to do. So as you sit here today, uh, and those on the bubble, and uh, Kevin has us on the, um, on the uh, YouTube channel and all that stuff, so obviously we have gone viral. I want you to know that when the Lord looks upon you, 
If you don't know him in a personal way, he sees you as his creation, as someone he loves. Now he can't look past your sin, but he looks past it to see who you are, his creation. So in order to take that uh, film of sin out of the way, so that he could look upon you as his son, God had to provide a way. And that was through Jesus Christ. For those of us that know the Lord, we have put our faith in him. Uh, the Lord has forgiven our sins. He sees us as his children. When he looks upon us in either case, before I knew the Lord, 35 years ago now, and after I knew the Lord for the last 35 years, on either side of that, when he looked upon me, he looked upon me with an undying love. A love that was so intense that he did the ultimate sacrifice that I may have a relationship with him. He gave his only begotten son. I would not have paid that. Fortunately for me, I am not God. <laughs> I'm just here representing him today verbally and I, and I want you to know that when he looks on you, he looks on you with love. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Anybody knew, know who Frank E. Graff is? Frank E. Graff. He wrote about 200 hymns. So some of our musicians sing his songs and probably don't realize that Frank had a hand in it. Frank was born in 1860, uh, which wasn't that long ago, really, when you think about it. And he died in 1919. So he would have been, what, 60-ish ish when he died. Uh, he was a, a Methodist pastor, and uh, he served some of the leading churches in the Philadelphia area. So in addition to his pastoral work, he wrote hymns, and he wrote about 200 of them. Uh, he was known in his ministry as the Sunshine Pastor because he did so much to um, brighten people's lives. And he had, uh, I got a bum leg, so I'm going to use this chair. Frank went through some very difficult times himself, and uh, he wrote a song during a period of great despondency in his life that just um, uh, speaks to my heart in a way that makes it uh, very difficult for me to even talk about the song. Uh, it, it hit me at a time in my life when, um, when uh, I had suffered my own personal great loss. And uh, the song just spoke to my heart. I can't sing it. I cannot sing it. Of course, you guys know I can't sing. <laughs> but I do sing when I'm alone. And uh, this is when I cannot sing. I just have to listen to it, and I'm going to read some of it to you. Um, the song is, Does Jesus Care? Uh, you guys ever heard the song? I know we have. We've sung it not for a long time. Not that I could sing it anyway. But I want you to know that he does. How about when there's no hope for help? You know, I think that's where Frank found himself. Does Jesus care when my heart is pained too deeply for mirth or song? As the burdens press and the cares distress and the way grows weary and long. Does Jesus care? Well, does he? I'd like to look into your hearts today. I'd like you to do that. I'd like you to see that he does. Does Jesus care? Oh yes, he, he cares. Remember the leper that fell on his face before the Lord? Luke chapter 5. And Jesus touched him. 
And he said, I will be thou clean. Do you remember when you came to the Lord and said, I'm a sinner? I can't fix this. I know you did. I'm putting my faith in you, the finished work on the cross, to save my soul. At that moment, he touched you. And you were saved. And you never need to go back to readdress that again. It means when he touches you, it means that he attaches himself to you. And I think with this leper, he physically grabbed the guy. He didn't just reach out and touch him and heal him. He embraced him. And he embraced me as a hellbound sinner. You know, does Jesus care? Uh, yes, he cares. You remember that, the refrain of that song? Uh, it's kind of mellow, melodic. Oh, yes, he cares. I know he cares. His heart is touched with my grief. When the days are weary, the nights dreary, I know my Savior cares. I know he cares. In the ministry, at times, Granny and I over the years have had um, insight into some of your lives and, uh, and some of your burdens. And there's little that the two of us can do, or Jose is a pastor and uh, Pastor Briggs can physically do sometimes to stop those things. We just can't. Uh, but we can carry the message, Jesus cares. Oh yes, he cares. I wish this song was in your books. How about when you can't see the way ahead? When you don't know what tomorrow is going to bring? Well, verse 2 says, does Jesus care when my way is dark? With a nameless dread or fear. As the daylight fades into deep night shades, does he care enough to be near? I would say, from our own experience, yes, he does. He cares enough to be near. And again, the refrain, oh, yes, he cares. Frank said, in his, when he was writing this song, I know he cares. His heart is touched with my grief. When the days are weary, the long nights dreary, I know my Savior cares. So in those first two verses, Frank wrote a lot about himself. When he wrote about, how about when there's no possible hope for help? And then in verse 2, he writes about, how about when you cannot see the way ahead? You don't know what tomorrow holds, but it could hold very bad things. Oh yes, he cares. Verse 3 Frank wrote about, how about when we grieve about our own sin? I have fallen and stumbled in sin. Does he care? Does Jesus care when I've tried and failed to resist some temptation strong? <clears throat> when for my deep grief there is no relief, though my tears flow all the night long. Does Jesus care? Well, does he? Oh yes, he cares. I know he cares, his heart is touched with my grief. When the days are weary, the long nights dreary, I know my Savior cares. And I want you to know that today. I know my Savior cares. He cares. He loves, he grieves, he cries. He does all of that with us. Verse four of his song, may have been the motivation for him writing this thing. How about when we lose someone we really care about? Does he care? Does Jesus care when I've said goodbye? <clears throat> to the dearest on earth to me, 
Jose, I knew I should have had you read this. And my sad heart aches till it nearly breaks. Is it aught to him does he see? I'm telling you. Oh yes, he cares. I know he cares. His heart is touched with my grief. When the days are weary, the long nights dreary, I know my Savior cares. Honestly, I marvel at anybody that can sing this song. <laughs> I can't even read it. I'd like to uh, tell you the one thing I know in life, outside of Granny and you know our relationship, which I count very special, is that Jesus Christ cares. Jesus Christ cares for your soul. When he looked on you, he did not see a worthless sinner that he's going to cast to the side and put in hell. When Jesus Christ, God the Father, Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, when they looked upon us, they saw something they wanted to redeem. I want that back. I want to recover what I have lost. How did he do that? There was only one way that he could recover what he lost, and that was to give himself. He put himself on that cross, and in that pure, innocent blood that was shed on that cross, he paid the penalty and paid the price that I should have paid. When he looked on me, he looked past my sin and looked on something he wanted to redeem. But the sin had to be removed, and that's what Christ did. I would like to have, uh, Eck, would you be able to serve the table today? Are you okay with that? I know you got kids all back there. Uh, would you come up, please? And uh, Jose, would you come up, please? Does he care? And I apologize for the emotion of that song. I can't get through it. So it was probably a mistake to pick the text. but. I want you to know, in what we're celebrating today, one thing, yes, he cares. Oh, yes, he cares. His heart is touched with my grief. When the days are weary, the long nights dreary, I know my Savior cares. I know he cares. I know he does. And I know you carry heavy burdens. I look around the room, and I know those burdens. They're very heavy. Oh, yes, he cares. First Peter 5, 6 says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Those times are coming. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Oh, yes, he cares. Would you guys, uh, Jose, would you first uh, ask the Lord to bless the broken, the bread? Heavenly Father, as we come before you now with the sacraments before us, we do this in obedience. We also know that you said to um, do this in remembrance of me, of my death. And I pray, dear God, that as we think about your death and what beautiful words that we just heard concerning Jesus caring, uh, you can't care, you couldn't have cared more than this. I mean, this is a perfect example of how much you care. And we are eternally grateful. Bless this Father now. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Would you distribute the bread, please? 1 Corinthians 11, 23 says, For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you. Uh, what Paul is saying in that phrase is that he is delivering to us exactly what he was given. And I believe it was a revelation of the Lord that he was given this. And he is passing it on in a direct fashion. He says that the Lord, the same night in which he was be betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. 
and the, the, the crackers they're distributing are and have been for 2,000 years a representation of the broken body of the Lord Jesus Christ. When he says to take, eat, in the Greek that means to lay hold of. We are to lay hold of this. We're to really understand it and grasp it. What is, what is it that he wants us to grasp? Well, he wants us to grasp. He goes on to talk about the, 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 uh, the bread, which was, thank you, Jose, uh, was broken. Uh, his body on that cross was literally torn apart, just as a piece of bread was during their meal. How many of you have been to, I know lots of you have been to the Middle East, right? Raise your hands if you've been there. I mean, some of you have lived there for extended periods of time. And you, see, you know how they do their bread. The, the, these guys around this table would have understood that when he was talking about tearing the bread apart, uh, after the fact, as they looked back on it, they would have had an aha moment and said, now I get it. He was using that bread to show us what they were about to do to his body. And in remembrance, then, we are to recall that. The fact that Jesus Christ, when he looked on you, what did he see? What did he see? He saw a soul that he wanted to redeem. That's what he saw. He saw someone he loved so much that he would give, God the Father would give his son that we might uh, have eternal life. I am in awe of this. And as we think about remembering, recalling, recollecting, we should be in awe of what God did for us. Because when he looked upon you, had you been the only person on earth, the only one, what do you think he'd have done? The same thing he did. He'd have redeemed your soul. That's how much he thinks of you as an individual. Sometimes it's hard when we think on this to get beyond the group and down to the individual. But that's where Jesus is. When he looks upon you personally, he sees someone that he would die for. Sage Greek Church, let's remember the broken body of Jesus Christ. Eck, would you ask the blessing on the, uh, the uh, uh, grape juice as a representation of his blood? Father God, we thank you for allowing us to have this moment uh, to always remember what Jesus did. Uh, we pray that you may uh, bless the, the blood, the, uh, the wine, which represents uh, Jesus' blood that died on that cross uh, for, uh, for our sin, God. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Eck. Would you distribute that to the church? Verse 25 of our text, 1 Corinthians 11, says, After the same manner also, he took the cup. And when he had supped, saying, uh, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. When he had that in mind, when he talked about the blood, the, the, uh, the cup of the blood of the Testament, he had you as an individual in mind. Not we as a group. You as an individual. He put your name in his thoughts. He saw me 2,000 years down the road, and he said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. And he's talking to Terry. And he said, this do ye, as oft as ye drink it, remember me. Remember what I've done for you. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. We do it as a church, as a family. But it is for each of us as individuals as we come together. Thank you, Jose. The word new there uh, is an interesting word. The cup of the New Testament in my blood. That, the word new there means that what he did on that cross in shedding his blood for us is unprecedented. It has never been seen before. And of course, the testament is a covenant. It is, a, it, it is something that's never been seen. Uh, it's a, uh, this unprecedented covenant is due to one thing, and that's his blood. Uh, and he shed his blood for one reason. What is the one reason? What is that one reason? Me. 
the little two-letter me. That's why he shed his blood. He shed it for me. And we're to announce it. We're to declare it. He says, show. Looking for the word show. Okay, for as often as you do show the Lord's death till he come. It means to, uh, to publicly proclaim my faith in Christ. All right? Sage Creek Bible Church, let's remember the shed blood of Christ on the cross. And what he has done for you as an individual, for us as a group, without the individual work, there would be no group. So, Jose, would you close this portion of our service in prayer, and let's move into the next. Heavenly Father, what a privilege and honor to participate with my church family uh, in this this communion. We ask now, Lord, that uh, you continue, Lord, to help it to have its proper place in our hearts and minds as we go about our day, that we've taken communion service today in faith, in the knowledge that the blood that was shed uh, cleanses us from all our sins and has set us it, to be in a place where we can be called sons and daughters forever. We give you all praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate it very much. Zin, I see you back there. How's it going? Haven't had a chance to catch up. They keeping you busy? Uh, blessings from the Lord. Good. Good. All right. Today, you want to bring it up? Our IT section is on it. Today we're going to study, well, first of all, before we go, these are just three pictures from our uh, firewood run. Uh, the, uh, you see, it, is that Abby sitting on a piece of treasure? And, uh, and we're cutting up some treasure. I think that's Max. Is that, is that standing by? Is that Evelyn? I don't know. But we had a, a, an awesome work crew on um, Friday morning early as we made a firewood run that day, and, uh, and these folks are, uh, it was a lot of fun to work with them that day. Uh, it went from log to blocked to loaded. And we call this a firewood kit. It comes as a kit. Next slide, please, Lauren. Today we're going to, oh, Jose, do you have those sign-in sheets? I do, they're right up here. Okay. If you're part of the hospice team, these messages we're going through right now, the, the, uh, the staff at the hospital that works with the state has consented to allowing us to count these as hospice training because of the title for the message, right? Jesus Christ, the ultimate hospice chaplain. So this is part of our training. We have to have 15 hours a year and these messages count. Jose has a sign-in sheet going, so we need you to sign it. But today we're going to study the story of the man who was, who was, <laughs> the man who made blind men see in John chapter 9. And I think it's very important to understand why we're, we're taking texts out of the book of John. Next slide, please, Lauren. John 20, verse 30. Truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. Next slide, please, Lauren. John, as directed by the Holy Spirit, he chose some of uh, Jesus' most impactful miracles out of the thousands that he witnessed. Do you know that he witnessed thousands of miracles? He witnessed thousands of things that the Lord Jesus did, and he picked these key things, the most impactful miracles uh, out of all of those that he witnessed Jesus perform, and he recorded them as special, as special signs of glory of, the, of Jesus Christ. You can kind of see a list here. You know, your own list may be even added to that as you go through the book of John. Uh, but right down to the, to the miraculous catch of fish, he changed water into wine. He healed the ruler's son. He healed the disabled man. He fed the, 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 the 5,000. He walked on the sea. He healed the man that was born blind. That is our study for today, chapter 6. And he raised a dead man. And, of course, in the end, there was the miraculous catch of fish. 
Out of everything that the Lord Jesus did, John picked these specific things. Next slide, please, Lauren. The reason he did um, is specific. And you will find the answer, uh, boy, I tell you. It's a, the answer we're going to get to here just shortly, but some recognized and believed these signs as validating the identity of the Lord Jesus. That's why he did what he did. He wanted to validate his identity. Who else could cause a blind man to see? We see the two different reactions, even in the time of the Lord Jesus. Uh, John 2.11 says his disciples believed in him, but some did not believe those signs. John 12.37. There's your skeptics right there. But although he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him. Isn't that incredible? It's, it's, I'm incredulous sometimes when I look at what he did and the thought that you don't think he's who he says he is. So these miraculous signs gained varying results from the people. Next slide, please, Lauren. So John chose each of these signs for a specific purpose. He chose everyone for a specific purpose. Out of the thousands he could have chosen from, he chose those, I'm going to say, eight primary miracles that are listed in the book of John for a specific purpose. Uh, sli next slide, please, John. Or, I'm sorry, I'm looking at John. I'm thinking that, Lauren. Okay. Here are the reasons he picked those. And before we leave our study in the book of John, we have got to get this. This is an absolute necessity that you understand this. John 20, 31 speaks of four things that we must know. Number one, he carefully selected the data that went into his text. These are written, right? These are written. The book of John was specifically written to us so that we might find life in Jesus Christ. That's why it was written. He chose his text carefully from amongst a mountain of data. Have you ever done that? You know what I would do these days? I would do what I did when I still worked at Schriever. I would hire Lauren. That's what I would do. At one point, I had a mountain of data that I needed to parse through. A mountain of data. And, uh, and, and Lauren being Lauren, he was out there at the time. Uh, I had him uh, write a script. I think that parsed through all this data to get the nuggets out of it that I needed. Well, that's what John did. He went through this mountain of data uh, to, to do all this. John 21, 25. There are also many other things which Jesus did, the which if it were written, every one. I suppose even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. What would be the primary miracle in your life that you would expect John to include in his book if he would have put it all in there? What is it? Salvation. Salvation of who? Me. Me. My salvation. He saved my soul. I'm on that list. What does that tell you? You're valuable. Yeah, we're valuable. And it tells us that that list, uh, many things which Jesus did, which if it were written, wouldn't be in the books. Well, guess what? We are in the book. Where is that book? Heaven. Heaven. What is that book? Life. The book of life. The book continues to be written. Believers in Jesus Christ are in it. That's how much he cares. Right? Are you guys okay if I go um, charismatic on you here? No. No. <laughs> I tell you, we're in the book. Believers. You know, that's why you're here, right? You believe in Jesus Christ. You're in the book. The list continues. If it were written, yeah, it is written. And you're there. And the world itself cannot contain what's in that book. So, these are written. You've got to get that. These are written so the book of John was carefully selected for a specific purpose. Number two, he wants his text to cause us to believe in Jesus Christ. These are written that you may believe. 
So you got two things there. It was written out of all this data for a specific purpose that you may believe. We saw last week that this is not simply a matter of correct orthodoxy. Uh, he insists that we believe both with the head and with the heart. Okay, establishing a, a personal relationship with him by being born again by putting your faith in Christ. And let me define being born again again so that we get this because you're going to get picked on when you say, I'm, born, I'm a born again believer in Christ. Oh, yeah, 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 you're born again and again and again. I get it. That is a, 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 a great thing to tell the world because when you were born again, what happened when you were born again is that you were equipped for the kingdom that is to come. The environment that you're going to enter into, that's what being born again means. I was equipped to enter into the environment I'm about to go into. It's like your physical birth. Born again means you were physically born, now you're spiritually born. When you were physically born, you were equipped to enter into the environment that you entered into. That's simply physical birth. Spiritual birth is exactly the same thing. When we're born of God by putting our faith in Jesus Christ, we are equipped to enter into the environment that we're about to live in. That's what being born again is all about. Number three, he wanted us to grasp that we could trust Jesus because of who he is. I can put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ because Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. So the miracles that he chose that went into the book of John are specifically to tell us that Jesus Christ is the Christ and that he is the Son of God. We're to make that connection based on what he recorded there. Uh, only the anointed one, the Son of God, our creator, can create new life within us. But he did that too when he raised Lazarus from the dead. He did that specifically to show us that Christ could create new life within us. And number four, he tells us what his mission, what his recorded mission is, Jesus Christ. And that is to get us to believe in him that we may have life through his name. So those four things are there in that verse. John wants his readers to do something with the data that he's presenting. He wants each of us to make an intentional, personal decision to believe in Jesus. That's what he wanted. And for 2,000 years, John's book has done that. His mission is to bring eternal life to anyone who will call upon the name of Jesus. That's what he's telling us. Everything in the book of John, everything, from John 1, 1 to John 22, whatever the last verse is, should be interpreted from the perspective of those four things. Those four things will guide you through uh, a, a book that some people scratch their heads over, but when you know why it was written, you know then what he's saying, okay? Next slide, please, Lauren. You guys know who that is? Yes, genius, that's a 10, good? Ten? Okay. December 1845, Charles Dickens wrote a book called A Christmas Carol. Have you guys ever... Uh, it, it's my all-time favorite Christmas movie. Uh, it is. My favorite version is the 1951 version starring Al Alistair Sim. It is awesome. He, when he plays the part of Scrooge. Next slide, please, Lauren. My favorite line in the movie is spoken by Tiny Tim. There he is right there. He says he hoped uh, the people saw him in, in the church because he was a cripple. And it might be pleasant to them to remember upon Christmas Day who made lame beggars walk and blind men see. Who's he referring to? Christ. 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 He says, here I am a cripple. I hope they look upon me and, uh, and that it would be pleasant to them to remember who made lame beggars walk and blind men see. This was quite a statement of faith from a young person who was a cripple in a society that had little time for him. Uh, how people would look upon that crippled little boy, I think, would reveal what was in their hearts. And I'm, I, I, I'm always thankful for those who have, uh, they, you know, Jose and, and uh, oh, Gus and, and Herb, and they set the tone uh, the piano playing from Joseph and the other players as well. They set the tone for our service with prayer and singing. 
And they really do. When, when they, it's an awesome thing they do. When they get done with the pulpit and they turn it over, they really put a focus on the one who made lame beggars walk and blind men see. Listen to what they say. Everything they say is focused on Jesus Christ and, and what he did. And I'd say, praise the Lord for these men who seek to serve God. And believe me, uh, the ladies more so even than us men. I'm ashamed to say sometimes. But the entire movie is about making a blind man see. And who was the blind man? Scrooge, right? There's much to see in John chapter 9, and that's what we're going to do. As we investigate this chapter, let's pray that our eyes are fully open and our hearts can see. See who made lame beggars walk and blind men see. Who is this man? You guys remember Hochstetler on Hogan's Heroes? When he looked at Hogan, what did he often say? Who is this man? <laughs> well, when we look upon the scriptures, let's ask that question of ourselves. Who is this man? So to get to John chapter 9, the end of John chapter 8 tells us that Jesus was leaving the company, that actually the country and the company of the, of the Gergesenes. He was leaving by their own request. Remember, he had healed two men that were possessed of devils. And they said, please leave. You got to get out of here. They didn't want anything to do with the Lord Jesus. Next slide, please, Lauren. Upon his departure from the Gergesenes, um, he came upon a blind man. And it's an amazing story. And we're going to divide this chapter into three parts. And my plan was to, how late can we go today? Are you guys good with three? Okay, we'll compromise and just say 1.30. We're going to, we're going to do this uh, in three parts. Part one, we're going to look at the source of the fault. Whose fault is it that this man was born blind? We're going to look at the source of the fault. Then we're going to look at the solution to the fault. Then we're going to look at the sordid fallout from the fault. Okay? What do those things all have in common? Fault. Yes. And there's one thing just as important. They all start with S, don't they? Yeah. The source, the solution, and the sordid fallout from the fault. All right, next slide, please, Lauren. Let's look at our story. Please open your Bibles to John chapter 9. I would expect that, uh, that on your keyboards, on your little keyboards, and on the pages of your Bible, John chapter 9 would be pretty well worn because it's the most awesome chapter in the whole Bible. John chapter 9. Now, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was born or was blind from birth. He, he, he saw a man who was blind from birth. Do you think this was a chance meeting? Was this just a chance meeting? That they, I don't think it was. Jesus would use this opportunity to further establish his identity, to show them his word to forgive sins had all the power and authority it needed. Also, let me make this clear, because, you know, as we look at ourselves as sinners, saved by grace through Jesus Christ, we need to see that we have a need. We need to see that we have a need for Jesus Christ. If you don't see you have a need, you don't do anything with the data. You've got to see that you have a need. And that will be his message to the disciples. And then they would take that message out later. John chapter 9, verse 2. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned? this man or his parents, that he was born blind. So what do you think? I think because he was born blind, the disciples puzzled over whose fault the blindness belonged to. Whose fault is it, is what they're asking. A common belief amongst the Jews was that physical sickness directly resulted from sin, like leprosy, blindness. It was one of those things. So the disciples faced a theological problem. It was probably one that the Pharisees were arguing about in their schools and, and all that kind of stuff. But believing that sin caused all suffering, 
How could a person be born with a handicap? They believed there could only be two possibilities. Either this man sinned in his mother's womb, or his parents sinned. Could have only been those two. That's pretty deep stuff, right? Uh, they were more occupied, by the way, in solving an abstract theological problem than in ministering to the individual that had aroused the question in the first place. They were using it as an example. They regarded him as a sinner and making him less important than their debate. And honestly, their lack of emotion toward the guy is a bit disturbing at this point in their ministry careers. They referred to the man as a beggar rather than by his name, which I, uh, I think is important to note. So while they probably, they held no hard feelings toward him, nothing personal, they just simply regarded him as a sinner, a nuisance, who probably deserved what he got. He was unproductive, he didn't contribute anything to society or the community, and he was one more mouth to feed. They were not so much unkind, I think, as they were just indifferent. And I don't think that blind man, uh, as he sat there, do you think he could hear their conversation? Do you think he could? Oh, yes. I, I says, we, um, <laughs> I've been privy to that with, uh, with people who, uh, I mean, here they are talking, and the blind man is sitting right there, and they're talking about him. Do they assume that because he's blind, he can't hear also? I think they did. So certainly we'll see that the Pharisees made that assumption. Uh, but Jesus quickly answered here and he said, uh, and I'm sure he said this also in the earshot of the man, uh, in contrast here to how the disciples referred to him, Jesus viewed him as a man, not as a beggar, not as anything but an individual that he loved. And that's, I'm telling you, that's what he sees when he sees you. Before you got saved, he didn't care if you were a beggar or a billionaire. He cared about your soul. After you got saved, that's when we really became beggars, right? What, what's another word for beggar? Prayer, a prayer, someone who prays. We became beggars after we got saved. So, uh, let's see, John 9, 3. Could you go to the next slide, please, Lauren? Thank you. John 9, 3. Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. There's a mission here. There's an objective. And this man, he doesn't see him as a worthless piece of society. He sees him as a man. But the English translation of this verse is, is very difficult. Uh, to make it read well, it can leave the impression that God caused this man to be born blind so that this incident could occur. I don't believe that's true. I don't believe that's true. Uh, I believe Jesus took advantage of a situation that he knew would occur to teach a valuable lesson to all of us. You see, God's initial creation in Adam and Eve was absolutely and totally perfect. There was no blindness, there was no leprosy, there was no lameness. Sin corrupted everything. When sin entered the picture, um, it, it, it corrupted everything to include our bodies. Uh, the aches and pains, they would all start as they fell into sin. What do you think they said the first time Adam and Eve worked all day and, and were sore that night? Something they'd never experienced. What did they say? That's what they said. They said, where's the granny candy? That's what we call Motrin at our house. Granny candy. So God's initial creation was absolutely perfect. Uh, I, honestly, I could spend the rest of the morning telling you about my own physical issues. <laughs> They're all the result of sin in the garden. Our bodies are decaying as we wear them. That's why Jesus Christ died on the cross, that he could rescue us from all that. But this man's blindness, like all defects, visible and invisible, ultimately can be traced to sin in the fall in the garden. They didn't exist before then. But Jesus, but Jesus, who is God in the flesh, and that is one of John's objectives, is to convince us that Jesus is God in the flesh, and he is the great creator. John chapter 1, we're going to get there 
can use this blind man who was made imperfect by sin to display his magnificent glory by overcoming that imperfection. He's going to heal him to show us he has the ability to forgive us our sins. Sin caused this blindness. Jesus displayed his power to overcome sin by healing this man. It's what I think. So sin, so the, the, the message is clear. Because of what he would go on to do on the cross, Jesus can take us in all of our sinful imperfection and save our souls by causing us to be born again. Jesus healed the, the, the sinful cancer within our souls and restored us to complete and eternal spiritual health. The new man within us is eternal. I like what Herb was teaching this morning on the new man. But he didn't do it by fixing the old in us. In the new birth, he created a new man within us, which is without sin or defect. And that is what will go to, go to heaven. Uh, next slide, please, Lauren. 2 Corinthians 5, 16. He says, Therefore, from now on, we, we regard no one according to the flesh. Or that means by fleshly standards. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, what he's saying there is before we were saved, we used artificial ways to evaluate Christ and even each other. Yet now we know him that way no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. The new man within you has no defects at all. As a result of his conversion, Paul no longer evaluated people based on their educational levels or their physical externals. He would not evaluate a blind man and call him a sinner because he was blind. Paul is telling us we don't do that. The death and resurrection of Jesus Christ forever destroyed all human distinctions like that, or even between Jews and Gentiles. We are now together in the same church. When we look at each other, it should not be as the disciples looked upon that blind man. We should see, as we look on each other, a child of God. And that includes those who have physical issues. Cerebral palsy, autism, uh, autism. Um, what are some of the things we see in the uh, nursing home? We see dementia. We see... Um, the uh, golly guys, the name escapes me, and what does that tell you about what I may be afflicted with? Um, oh, Alzheimer's disease, thank you. Or blindness. Some of those out there have uh, macular degeneration. Some of us here have that too. I see my future in how they live their lives. So uh, that's all there. But when we look on each other, should we look on those things? I say no. That's what the Lord is telling us here, too, as a church. We look on each other, we should see children of God. Spiritually speaking, our, our, our defects are gone. As Jose so skillfully brought for <coughs> Wednesday evening, when we look on each other, we should see brethren. And that blind man would uh, picture this for us. Next slide, please, Lauren. Another text that they might have thought about uh, as they were looking upon this blind man, is Exodus chapter 4 and verse 10, and then on into 11. Uh, Moses is speaking with God about presenting the word to the people. And Moses is speaking with God about the path ahead, and, um, and Moses parked in it, and Moses says this. He said, I am not eloquent. In other words, I can't speak. Neither heretofore nor since hast thou, uh, thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. Moses can only see his own shortcomings. But God quickly responded, and he said this. Uh, he says, So the Lord said to him, Who has made men's mouth? Or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Well, this verse, I think, is often taken out of context by people like the disciples as they looked upon this blind man and upon Christians to this very day. The Hebrew word for makes is sum. Sum. Uh, the word make does not mean create. Does not mean create. It is used in a great variety of applications in the Old Testament, but it basically, in its basic form, means to put. 
God is saying that he can take a man like Moses, who was made imperfect by sin, and put him in a place or role that puts God's glory on full display to his creation. That's what he is saying. He is not saying, I made people mute, I made them deaf, I made them blind. He is saying, I can use them people, I can take them and put them in key spots to use them for my glory. That's what he is saying. So what do you think is going on then in John chapter 9? He is using a blind man by putting him in a place where he can be used for the glory of God. That's what he's saying. He didn't say, I made him blind. He's saying, I'm using someone who is blind. That's how God does it. But this, this verse often leads to the same thoughts that the disciples have. And uh, I don't think it's correct thinking. We need to refocus on that and, and realize that people with physical defects, God uses them in very special ways in very special places. Verse 14, or slide 14, please, Lauren. Actually, it's 15, I think. Yeah, it's 15. Can you guys see that okay? In my opinion, those who struggle with disabilities are the most glorious people you can ever meet to include those among our own congregation. The Bible teaches that every person conceived in this world is a unique creation of God, and that includes people we consider, in our thought, to be disabled or handicapped. I love this verse. You saw me, this is the, uh, this is, uh, I'm gonna read you the New Living Translation of this. I don't use the New Living Translation as a Bible, I use it as a, a text or sometimes a commentary. Um, he says, you saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. So in the mind of God, the recording of each life is clear to him. From the very moment of conception, God begins to fashion the parts of the body, even before they're recognizable. Over the course of hours, days, and then months. We grow from how many cells when we were conceived? How many cells were there when we were conceived? One. One. And then that cell split, and they split, and they formed what we are. It started the hour you were conceived. And over the days and months, we grow from a single cell into the most complex organism in creation. That's got to be of God, right? How can you look at that as a scientist and deny God's hand in all of that? So to God, as Jesus Christ looked upon that blind man, he said life is precious, and this blind man was precious to him. So I don't believe God intentionally made this man blind. I believe he took the opportunity to use him as a visible picture of his ability to forgive sin. Also, I don't believe God made Lazarus sick. We just studied him a couple weeks ago. I believe he stepped out of the way and let it run its course so that he could use that sickness as another visible picture of his ability to forgive sin and grant us new life. That's what he did. He didn't make Lazarus sick, but he sure used it to, to his glory and to our hearts. So the ones in our midst who work each day with those who are disabled, you know, praise God, God's grace shines brighter through them than I think through anybody in our society. We have folks in our, in our congregation who work with the disabled, with the abused, with, with et cetera, et cetera. Those are the ones that I think God's light shines the brightest through. They, despite their own physical limitations, caused by a body failing because of sin, show us the way. They stand up, they step up, and they do the job. Is Rosalie on? Okay, Rosalie's not on, so I'm going to take the moment. Uh, she would probably be embarrassed, so don't tell her I said this. But it's people like Rosalie, working with Kirsten, that make this world go round. That's what it is. Yes. Yeah, obviously, right? The light of God's grace shines through her actions more than, than, uh, than, than most. Rosalie said, I talked to her this morning. Kirsten has therapy every single day next 
Okay. To include the 4th of July? No, not the 4th of July. Okay. Yeah. No, she has, that's, a, that's an incredible emotional and physical burden for her. Uh, so you've got people like that in our midst. Uh, praise God for them, like I say. Uh, and I'm not going to call any more names. I can see you out in the audience. I'm not looking at you directly. I know that you work with, uh, with folks who are on the emotional side of disaster and, and try and bring them back. And do it in spite of the fact that you, you have your own life to live. These are the things that make God's grace shine to the world. They're the things that, that show the world that God is real. The gospel is true. And what John said is real. Next slide, please, Lord. John chapter 9, verse 3. And I know I'm getting close to my end of time here. I'm already a little bit... Uh, sh well, okay, I'm going to finish up our first point. <laughs> Whose fault is it? I wanted to get through two steps here, but we won't. Uh, John 9, 3 says, Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, wasn't their sin at all, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. That's why he used this blind man, so that the works of God could be revealed in him. The phrase works of God that Jesus used is critical. Okay, John 6, 29, Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God. What is the work of God? That you believe on him whom he hath sent. That is the work of God. He wants you to believe. If you haven't believed in him, and I mean to entrust him with the safekeeping of your soul, let today be the day. Believe on him whom he hath sent. So Jesus would use this situation with the blind man to give us grounds to believe in Jesus. That's why John put it in the book, so that we would have grounds to believe in Jesus. And that certainly fits our key verse, John 20, 31. You can take John 20, 31, our four tenets, go back to John chapter 9, verse 3, and John 6, 29, and know exactly what those verses refer to. See how it all fits together. It is not a puzzle. Well, it's kind of a puzzle, but you can put it together. Uh, next slide, please, Lauren. John 9, 4. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Well, while it's day, what, it, what he's telling him is that the time allotted for Jesus to do God's will in person has a limit. There's a limit set. A night represents that set end time to do God's work. What happened when he was on the cross? It, was dark. It, it grew dark. It went dark. The day, the time that the Messiah would physically walk on the earth with, uh, with the chosen people was over. In Jesus' case, the time limit is set for his coming death. When he's talking about the night. The night is coming when no man can work. That is him as he died on the cross. As the light of the world, Jesus gives people salvation. John 8, 12. You got it down here in the corner. I hope you guys can see it. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. So life is light. Life is light, and light brings life. After his death, his disciples went on to be his lights bringing Christ to others. And Matthew, as, he, as they're talking here, Matthew 5.14, that's a magnificent verse out of the Sermon on the Mount. The Lord says, you are the light of the world. Who is the you? The disciples. By extension, who does that mean today? Us, right? We are that light. We are that light. We bring the message that like the man who is blind, who is made to see, I have a message for you that can cause you to walk in the light. And it is Jesus Christ. He says, a city set on a hill cannot be hid. You've got to see it. And like I say, uh, this blind man is a perfect example because as we, even we look around our, 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 um, our folks here, there are folks in our midst who are first responders. In fact, they're before first responders. First responders, we have military, we have all those folks. Um, 
they shine the light of Jesus Christ to the world. And in that sense, it can't be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it gives light unto all those that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. That's what we are to do. We are to give light to the blind. Those that can't see their way out of their own way. We bring the light of the gospel to them that they can see the light of Jesus Christ. And in healing that blind man, that's what Jesus did. After his death, his disciples would go on to be the lights, bringing Christ to others, and we're the descendants. And by extension, all believers in all generations are to bring that light to the world until he returns. We preach the gospel when we can to those that are around us. I'll again use Rosalie since she's not here, because uh, I'm doing this without her permission or consent, and say it is the kind of actions like what she does that makes that light so bright, the world can't ignore it. That's how important this is. So when Jesus comes for his church, what do you think is going to happen in the world? When Jesus raptures the church out like he, is, like he says he would, what happens to the light in the world? It's taken out. In that instant, there is no more. There is no more. You as the light of the world, none of that will stay. It'll all be gone. Poof, gone. Now we've got folks like uh, our Kirsten in a wheelchair and others. What happens to them when he comes? They go too. They're gone too. The witness of the light through those people, which are the brightest that is in the world today, will be gone. There will be no more light until the Lord rolls things out with 144,000 witnesses and etc., etc., and the two witnesses, the gospel will then be preached to a world in total disarray because the light has been removed. It will be disaster. It will be utter disaster. And if I could do anything today, I would say look to Jesus Christ today. Don't enter that time because it won't be good. There will be no light. It will be each man for himself. It will be terrible. It will be a terrible time. Every believer will be removed, leaving nobody behind. Nobody behind. Now for those of us that are saved, you know, praise God for the light that he shined on us and let's reflect that light to others. We need to reflect that light to others. It's kind of like the moon. It doesn't generate its own light, but it reflects the light of the sun. That's why you can see it. We need to reflect the light of the sun. Okay, so if you haven't called on Christ for the saving of your soul, let today be the day. Now I'm going to stop there. Part two next week we'll pick up is the solution to the fault. Whose fault is it? Well, Christ has a solution to this. And then our third point will be the, the sordid fallout of the fault. And we'll see how it was reacted to this great miracle he's about to do. So John chapter 9, verses 1 through 5, you can read those as often as you want. From verse 6 to the end of the chapter, nobody can read those. I don't want you to know what's coming next. Right? Nobody said amen. amen. Huh? Absolutely. Thank you. Council of the Wise has spoken. All right, is Dave on? No. Okay. I'm going to, uh, we're going to, uh, Pastor Briggs, I want you to close us. And then Zinn, I'm going to get you to close us. And uh, uh, Jose, let's just go around to each of you guys as we close. Father, thank you for the privilege of uh, hearing what you are and have done every bit of the praise and glory in Jesus name Lord God uh, I'm reminded of your sovereignty Lord that even even sin can't overcome your providence and your sovereign power over this world Lord that you can overcome all things uh, including our sins and that when you look upon us 
uh, you see the righteousness and the beauty and the, the holiness and the wonderfulness of Christ uh, versus our, our own faults or our own sinfulness. We thank you so much for the love that you had in your son, um, so much so that you would you would give your son to us, Lord, and that um, and really in your glory you would show us such love uh, by sacrificing the, 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 your one and only son. Um, and, and there's no way we would see any love greater than that, Lord, that uh, that, that your beloved son was uh, was sacrificed to the cross for our for our sins. And Lord, help us. Help us to share that with the world and that you would use earthen vessels and jars of clay and, and, and such imperfect uh, people to, to spread your gospel, Lord, that that's your will, that, that through our weakness, your glory will shine, Lord. And we thank you for that opportunity and we ask that, um, that you continue to, to encourage us, uh, that, that we would not be uh, blinded by our own um, self-pity or our own deception of, of us. Uh, feeling weak or inadequate, Lord, because in you, our weakness is, is strength. And we thank you so much for, uh, for lifting us up, over overcoming our weaknesses, overcoming our, um, our, our, in, uh, our feelings of inadequacy, Lord, because in Christ, uh, you make us more than adequate. We, we thank you so much for that. Uh, Lord, uh, may, may, may John's words there... Um, Ring true that, that that the whole world will come to believe in your Son, Lord. To trust and to treasure Christ. Um, may, may our words, uh, as we go out today, this week, this weekend, uh, may, may we shape, may we shine that gospel out to the world, Lord, because it is so beautiful and it so reveals your love for this world. We thank you so much, in Jesus' name. Lord, we're grateful for the uh, for you making the complex symbol. Uh, the illustration of your spirit working in Rosalie and in, in, in everyone here in the way they minister to one another and the way they love one another is uh, more powerful than any words that we can come up with. We thank you for the, for the life that we're seeing before us, that the world can see the light of Jesus as she is uh, having the light of Jesus in her. We pray, Father, that we continue to share that light, spread that light, live that light uh, in, uh, this, throughout this week. We'll be back again safely next week in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.